And we're going to talk about the interaction uh, between the Supreme Court and, and presidents and the challenges of writing um, what the owner of the news organization I used to work for, the Washington Post Company, Philip Graham, called the first rough draft of history. How do you write that rough draft? Uh, um, often on deadline and dealing with very complicated legal issues that your audience doesn't generally understand. Um, so uh, if you think it's hard being a lawyer, imagine being a journalist covering the Supreme Court. I never could have done it myself, and that's why I'm the moderator. But we've got, a, uh, we've got an absolute all-star panel today, and I'm just going to introduce each of them briefly before we, we start the conversation um, left to right. Uh, Catherine Cryer, Judge Catherine Cryer, who was um, on the district court in Dallas County, Texas in the 1980s, and then she has gone on to a stellar career in journalism for CNN, ABC, Fox, Court TV. Uh, I may be missing one or two others. And she's written five books. And I have a chance, I've had a chance just in the last few days to start reading Patriot Acts, um, What Americans Must Do to Save the Republic, which has just come out and is absolutely terrific. Um, it's a true contextual look, uh, at historical contextual look at, at where we are right now. Um, Adam Liptak, uh, it covers the Supreme Court for the New York Times. Um, and, he, uh, he uh, it says he was a finalist um, for the Pulitzer. One of these days, Adam is going to get the Pulitzer. I don't think anybody has any doubt about that um, because the clarity of his expression and, and explanation of what happens at the court is uh, is first rate. Um, he uh, went to Yale and Yale Law School and kind of did the reverse of what some of my friends who were journalists and then became lawyers did. He started out as a lawyer uh, and, and uh, worked for a, a big New York law firm and then went to work at the New York Times in the legal department before deciding at considerable personal cost, I would imagine, to become a reporter. <laughs> you question my judgment about everything uh, I write. And, uh, um, he's also written for uh, The New Yorker and Vanity Fair and a lot of other magazines. Um, Jeff Schessel also has um, a fascinating and uh, uh, very uh, uh, untraditional career. Um, when I first met Jeff, he was a syndicated cartoonist. Um, and Thatch was in many newspapers. And he did that um, you know, after Rhodes Scholarship and other things. And he went on to be uh, a, a speechwriter for Bill Clinton um, involved in many of the uh, most important speeches of the Clinton presidency, um, and then um, founded, co-founded uh, uh, West Wing Writers, which does a lot of speech writing for people uh, uh, around Washington and New York. And he's written um, two outstanding books, uh, Mutual Contempt, which is this amazing story of the feud between Lyndon Johnson and and Robert F. Kennedy, and Supreme Power, which is very much on one of the topics of, of the day, uh, uh, which is about Franklin Roosevelt versus the Supreme Court. Um, so uh, we're going to get into some of this contextual comparative discussion that you began in the prior panel. Um, Steve Wormiel, um is somebody I was just noted telling him this, who I met when I was 19 years old, and he was this superstar reporter at that time for the Boston Globe and then later uh, for the Wall Street Journal where he, he covered uh, the Supreme Court um, with uh, uh, great skill um, for a number of years and, uh, and then um, became um, really the, well, let's 
let's call you the Robert Caro of Justice Brennan. Uh, where Only one volume. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it, it's, it's the definitive work on, on Justice Brennan, and um, he's taught at a lot of places and uh, currently um, uh, runs the Summer Institute on Law and Government uh, and teaches at American University in Washington. So I think with that, let's try to... Uh, see if we can dig in a little bit here. Um, I, I do want to start out by talking about um, these historic arguments that we, we all just witnessed on the Affordable Care Act. And um, uh, I want to start with you, Adam, because you were, were in the courtroom. And if you could, could you paint a, a picture of what it was like during those arguments, what it felt like, and what your main impressions were, the takeaways, not, not, not in terms of the news or a particular line, but just the atmosphere of the whole thing. So it was a three-day argument, and the first day was ordinary, sort of a, an intellectual parlor game with the justices, you know, toying with, with the idea of whether the Anti-Injunction Act applied or not. And then you show up for the second day where the constitutionality of the individual mandate was at issue, and the atmosphere was entirely different. Um, the courtroom was, was packed every day, but the sort of tension in the, in the courtroom was high. And I think that may have affected Don Verrilli, the Solicitor General, uh, who had a sort of rough start. And it only got worse when he was hit with a series of quite pointed and hostile and colloquial questions from all four of the votes uh, he needed. That is to say, he had the four liberal votes locked up. The, 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 the counting is quite similar, to, in a way, to the, uh, to the uh, New Deal era court. So he had four of the votes locked up. He, he knew he didn't have Thomas, and he had some hopes for maybe Alito, but certainly for Scalia, uh, Kennedy, and Roberts. Uh, Scalia and Alito are no longer on the table. Uh, he, he perhaps still harbors some hope uh, for, for Kennedy and or Roberts. But in the first 10 minutes, he's hit with this barrage of questions that really make you think for the first time, because the conventional wisdom had been, well, very nice, they're going to have this long argument, but obviously would, would, members of the Legal Academy would say, this is an easy case. The commerce power certainly extends to the regulation of a national problem like health care. And all of a sudden, you know, you sort of snap to attention and go, you know what? this thing really might go down. And that completely charges the atmosphere in the courtroom, and it probably affected Verrilli's performance. He's a very good lawyer, but he wasn't having a very good day. In the second hour of the argument, there, the questioning shifted a bit, and, and people will argue about whether there's something to be read into some Kennedy questions or not about how he might go the other way. But the available evidence from that second day of argument is roughly supportive of the famous Jeff Tubin assessment of what happened, which was that it was a train wreck for the administration. Now, the available evidence is not all the evidence, and many things have already happened that we don't know about and that will happen as the justices exchange drafts. But that day was really something. And then on the third day, it didn't get better for the administration. The severability argument proceeded on the assumption you know, for an hour and a half that the mandate was going down. And then what would seem to everybody to be the easiest issue, a sort of side issue about whether Medicaid, uh, whether the Medicaid expansion was constitutional. Even that, the justices gave a really a hard time on. So it was, it was quite an event. It really kept, kept you alert. Why, why do you think that really didn't better anticipate this? It, uh, in the D.C. Circuit, uh, Silberman, Judge Silberman, who ended up voting to uphold uh, the Affordable Care Act, also came on like a freight train. Uh, in oral arguments. So during prep for what was obviously the biggest case of his career, um, was, it, was it bad prep or what do you think happened to him? Um, it's hard to know why he didn't have a succinct answer to a question framed this way from Justice Alito. Give me in as succinct a way as possible uh, what your limiting principle is at which point uh, Verrilli really rambled on in a way that I reproduced in the New York Times and I felt kind of bad about it because it was very hard to follow. Um, and if you don't have an answer to that question, you know, that, it, it may not be necessary to have an answer to that question to win this case. You don't have to you know, explain every other case. You don't have to explain broccoli and burial, burial, insurance, burial insurance or whatever. But as, as you correctly say, John, 
that had to be a question about which he was mooted relentlessly. And it's, it's hard to know why he didn't have a better answer. And even on the broccoli question, he, he must have faced that at moot. Right? Yeah, no, so, so the questions weren't surprises. What was a surprise was I think it would have knocked the wind out of my sails, too, if right out of the box all of the votes that I know I'm focusing on capturing seem to be lost to me. And, and so you, do you agree with, uh, with Jeff Tubin that uh, it looks bad for, uh, for the administration? Looks bad. Looks bad is, you know, that, that's, not, that's not a final judgment. And there are various scenarios. You can play it this way and that way. But if the going in thinking was that this was in the academy at first a laugher and then at least a lopsided victory for the law, you know, we're now very, we're teetering on the balance. Uh, and... Anybody else want to jump in here on, on I know, Steve, that you, you were out doing a color commentary outside. Uh, do you share that basic assessment? Um, I do. I do still think it could come out either way, but, but I think everybody was stunned. You know, the academic commentary, as we were just talking before the panel, was so overwhelmingly assuming that this was, however controversial, an easy decision to uphold the act, that it's possible that the hostility of the questioning has produced an overreaction in the academic commentary, too, and that it's very much still up for grabs. But on the, on the Alito question, you know, that wasn't even a hostile question. That was arguably Alito's only friendly question. Give me a succinct, succinct statement of the limiting principle. I've played Verrilli's answer for some first-year law students who were getting ready for their first year moot court to show them what not to do, essentially. <laughs> Jeff? Um, I, I attended only the second day of argument, the, the individual mandate argument. And, and the thing that struck me was not only the hostility um, that Adam and Stephen have described, but, but the air of unreality to some of the questions, a lot of the questions that, um, that uh, Verrilli got from the conservative justices. Uh, if the court was looking at all to contradict the, um, the notion that some of us have that the justices are out of touch with reality, they weren't doing a very effective job. They seemed out of touch with reality or at least out of touch with realities that they didn't particularly like. Um, you had a general assumption across many of these questions. I don't know if you read it the same way, that when we're talking about people who are uninsured in this country, we're really only talking about young healthy people who opt out of the health care market because they're smart and they have better ideas about what to do with their money. This was an assumption behind many of the questions from Justice Scalia and Justice Alito, among others. Um, you had, uh, as you probably heard or read, Justice Scalia leaping forward as he does in his, in his padded chair to say, young people aren't stupid. They'll get the insurance when they need it, when they're, when they're older and they don't need the money for other things. Um, with no recognition at all that, of course, many of the 40, 50 million Americans who lack health insurance in this country lack it for very different reasons, such as pre-existing conditions, the loss of a job, and so forth. You had Scalia engaging in these sort of, uh, the sort of games that you would expect to happen for fun, really, in a room like this and not in the Supreme Court deciding the fate of 40, 50 million Americans, Questions like, well, what is a health care market really anyway? Is there such a thing as a health care market? And then lastly, you had Justice Alito uh, telling us that the, the cost shifting that we need to be concerned about is not the cost shifting from the uninsured who go to emergency rooms. Uh, and those are, of course, visits that the rest of us pay for in higher premiums and so forth. But the cost shifting that we all need to worry about is the cost shifting to healthy young people who don't want health insurance who are being dragged into the market by the government so the rest of us can have lower premiums. So again, th there was this, it, it's unclear whether this is what they really believe or whether they were simply having some kind of savage fun with Verrilli, but it really did seem well, did, quite removed did the, from the real did problem. The lib did the liberal justices and Verrilli fall down on the job by not jumping in and saying, no, we're not talking about you know, some Adonis 24-year-old uh, investment banker who doesn't want to have health insurance. Uh, we're talking about people with pre-existing conditions and people who can't afford health insurance. Why didn't they make that point? Was that seen as too political a point to make in the context of the argument? I guess Ginsburg won't. Kind of 
You think that Ginsburg? Well, it seemed that she, she, she was sort of the, the, the warrior as much as anyone in the room that would, would sort of pick up the slack. Um, just for, move on. I was I was a little bit stunned at some of the examples that the justices, uh, you know, the Scalia, the burial. It was this if there was no concept um, as to the the tentacles that that healthcare drives throughout um, our economy. I mean, just the, the myriad ways. It seemed there seemed to be a tone deaf approach, even in the examples and the challenges that they delivered, that really surprised me, and of course surprised me at the. At, the failure to respond. Well, what, is it right that reporters, and um, they all were, a ended up surprised? Does, does that show um, maybe uh, a failure on our part to sense just how political and ideological this court is? Maybe we shouldn't have been surprised. I'll just interject with a qu quick comment because I know Adam has something to say. But um, w one of those reporters, one of your colleagues, I can't call out this particular reporter, but I, I got an email <laughs> um, right after the argument. Um, this reporter said, I'm surprised at the extent to which I'm surprised. But, it, it, you know, I'll, I'll defer to Adam, who, who uh, is, is always there. But, but I, I think there was this sense, again, that um, we were in some kind of new territory, at least on the part of some of the correspondents I talked to. It's not hard to find shortcomings in the press, and I think this is you know, yet another one of them. That, that we didn't see this coming. I, I do think there's a link to the earlier panel where there was a lot of discussion about how this court has no political experience, very little real life experience. So the kinds of arguments Jeff was just making didn't really resonate with a court that really treated these issues as formal questions, not pragmatic questions about how society is going to solve this problem, but some kind of formal propositional logic puzzle that this court of logicians was going to figure out without reference to reality, so much so that Scalia at one point says, you don't expect me to read 20, this 2,700 page <laughs> law. That's crazy. Me? Read a law? At the same time, at the same time though, he's counting 60 votes. He's acting like the, you know, the Senate whip or something like that. And you know, uh, Catherine, give, since you've been on both sides, uh, you know, give us a sense, how much do judges among themselves talk uh, about uh, the you know the merits of and the politics of the law as well as the legal implications. I think when you're talking about you know both at the federal and state level, when you're sort of talking at the district court level, where it is very pragmatic, you really you're hearing cases on a regular basis. There's a whole different conversation once you move into the realm of the appellate courts. Uh, I I think you've you've got a much more esoteric bunch. They um, in most states and even the federal system, you've got a lot that have come through various um, jobs, certainly spending time on the court, but, but usually have a lot of, of practical experience. But as you move up the ladder, it is a, you, you really get the distinct impression that there is a removal from reality as you go up. And I do think the court has suffered tremendously, as was said on the earlier panel, uh, from the lack of sort of pragmatic worldly experience. I remember when there was a, a very young man appointed to the bench, a federal bench in, in Dallas, and he was appointed at age 28. And um, we were all sitting around talking about it and laughing. He was there. And somebody talked about Fleetwood Mac, and he didn't know who Fleetwood Mac was. He was 28 years old in the 80s. And we all, when he walked away, went, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's that sense that you completely yeah. removed. Yeah, Steve. Um, I just wanted to make one slightly different observation about the press coverage of this issue, because I think it's very qualitatively different than anything I can ever remember before. And that is mainstream media describing the details of Wickard versus Filburn and Gonzalez versus Get that on Reich. the front page some different year. <laughs> yeah, 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 um, yeah, you know, this has never happened before. So on the one hand, you could say, gee, why was the media surprised and what's going on in the politics of this? On the other hand, the actual level of the discussion in terms of legal detail or legal analysis 
was maybe greater than I can ever remember in any other instance. Well, a Adam, you got the Wickard story on the front page of the Times, which, as you said, is quite an accomplishment, Thank but you. I barely heard it mentioned at all in oral arguments. So it, would that be an example of something that in law school one would assume that Wickard is going to be the governing precedent in this case and that, you know, if you did it sort of, if you analyzed it the way cases have been analyzed for decades, it was absolutely right to do that story, but in a highly politicized environment where you have justices who might not have any experience in politics or in the real world, but, but you know, uh, are movement conservatives, um, does that mean the precedents have less importance than the politics? Listen, it's certainly true that there was no, there are basically four cases that matter, and there was discussion of almost none of them uh, during the argument. They were really working from first principles. But I don't, I don't want to make it seem that I'm buying in, because, because I'm not, to this notion that should the court strike down uh, the mandate, that that's some crazy, illegitimate, uh, politically driven outcome. If you buy into the notion, and it's a little hard because it doesn't resonate with me, that federalism really is a way to protect individual liberty. It's not an obvious proposition to me. But if this system of dual sovereignties does protect individual liberty and the mandate is doing something I think we have to concede is novel of not, you know, just taking taxes from me and, uh, and giving me services in return or giving some other guy services in return, but actually requiring me to go into business with some private company, I, you know, it, it's, that's different, it sounds different, then maybe there's some, you know, the, the argument on the other side, very well presented by Paul Clement, did take on force just as it was explained. Anybody else uh, see this as being a, uh, a closer call on, on the law than uh, it's been portrayed, at least in, in more liberal parts of the media? I mean, I, I would like to make an argument for actually waiting for the court to make a decision. Um, <laughs> I know that's a radical proposition. Um, I mean, I've had this argument with a half dozen different people in the last week that um, people will come up to me and say, if they strike it down, it's absolutely partisan. I said, well, suppose Obama had a fifth appoint, you know, there was a fifth Democratic appointee on the court and they upheld it by five Democrats voting for it and four Republicans voting against it. Would you say it was absolutely partisan? No, because you like the decision. Um, but, you know, I think we have to allow for the possibility that they will write opinions that might be persuasive and well-reasoned and actually explain why they're striking it down if they do strike it down and, and, and at least not sort of assume that the only way to explain that outcome is pure 100% partisan politics. Well, maybe there, uh, let me just raise the possibility um, that I was discussing a little bit uh, um, before the panel um, of a scenario that could conceivably uphold the law whereby Chief Justice Roberts would not want to get into a place where he um, you know, his, exp his own reputation and that of his court is exposed not just in the legal community, but conceivably exposed to a horribly embarrassing reversal should, a conser should Obama be reelected and a conservative justice uh, die or retire. Um, so, you know, you could have a situation where a, a year and a half from now, the, the, the law is uh, upheld after it's been overturned. Um, and is that the kind of calculation, and again, we're trying to get closer here to the political calculations that justices make, is that the kind of calculation that could possibly shape the outcome? Judges, Judge, I, judges are always worried about reversal, right? Yeah, but but to me, it, this really is a, a different planet uh, that we're that we're talking about. We have had um, you know such a divided court for so long with these five four decisions, um, very very politicized and increasingly so uh, every decade. As much as he does seem to be you know one that sort of respects the history of the court, and we'd all love to have consistently unanimous opinions. I, I don't think that would be a driving force um, in, in his motivations to, to uphold something like this. 
I, I meet you halfway. I do think the chief cares a lot about his legacy and about the reputation of the court. And it's not clear that in his agenda of things he wants to achieve, this is high on his list. And striking down the mandate might cement his legacy, even though he'll serve for another couple of decades. So there's all sorts of reasons that he might not want to play with this particular kind of fire. But I don't think among those reasons is that some later court might reverse him, in part because it's a practical matter. If the law goes down, particularly if the mandate goes down solo, Congress is going to have to fix it. And this very same precise issue, very unlikely to know how that would reach the court again. Just to look at the politics of this particular case for a second, I, I think, look, if, if the court overturns the ACA, then people like me and my friend, your friend Jeff Tubin, are going to write about it in this unholy trinity of cases from Bush v. Gore to Citizens United to this one. Um, I, I'm not optimistic that if the court strikes this down that you're going to get an opinion that is more convincing on its face than the majority opinion in Citizens United. But maybe I'm being cynical about this. Um, that said, uh, if I were a justice in this case, I would feel like I, to use Akil's phrase uh, from the last panel, I'd feel like I had a lot of running room here. We've all seen the polls on the ACA. This is not a 70, 30, 80, 20 issue. This is a, a, an issue in which the public is pretty deeply split, that if anything, it is more opposed than it is supportive. Uh, of course, yes, there are also these competing polls that suggest if you break down the ACA into its individual components that a lot of these, these components are, are, are popular in themselves. But the law as a whole is more unpopular than not. The individual mandate is suspect, as some recent polls have suggested. And so I, I think that with respect to public opinion, a justice who is even subconsciously taking this into account, as I, I'm sure they do, some of them, um, would have to feel that uh, he can go either direction pretty safely on this. So, I, so it's very, I think we probably all agree, very unlikely that Roberts by himself joins the four liberals and it <laughs> is, is, the, is the sole vote to, to uphold in a five to four upholding decision. But should Kennedy go there, which is perfectly plausible, the chief might go along. And you see six to three up to uphold, and perhaps in a case this big, the chief wants to write, and he can write it narrowly. And there's a way to write it where you can hold your nose. It would be like a little when they avoided deciding the Voting Rights Act. I think it's a terrible law, bad policy, really tests the limits of, of, of congressional power, but it's new, it's different. We're, we're, this is as far as we're ever going to let them go again, but we'll let this one slide. And there's lots of rhetoric in there that people can take comfort from, and they move on to the next, next case. Uh, you mentioned Jeff. You mentioned uh, Jeff Tubin. Um, he took a lot of heat for coming out and calling it a train wreck, and and the other things he said on CNN. Um, uh, is everything that gets reported now in a much more uh, is the re all the reporting, every adjective you use, in a much more political context, and should that affect uh, the way we do our job? I would really defer the co to the correspondence on this. Um, I'm freed of some of these constraints because I'm not actually reporting. I'm commenting from time to time. So nobody, if they read me at all, which is an open question, um, nobody's calling me on anything. Adam, do you, do you feel like um, it, it's an added burden on top of working for the New York Times, which a lot of conservatives loathe? Or is, has it changed much in the years you've been covering the court? Um, or is it? Has there always been a lot of heat from, from both sides? Um, you know, you have attentive readers, and they, <laughs> they, they, they point out your, um, your perceived mistakes. Um, I, you know, I think Jeff, and it, 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 I could turn the question back to you, John. He's, he's sort of this triple threat book author, TV guy, commentator, New Yorker writer. It's terrifying, you know, this multi-platform <laughs> entity. Uh, and it's probably good for the Tubin brand. I'm sure he believes wholeheartedly everything he says. But if you say something provocative, you know, that's, that gets your name in the paper. That's, that's good for business. If you turn out to be wrong, I don't think anyone's going to say you, you can't practice journalism anymore. Um, <laughs> I, I, I work under different constraints. Um, and it's, it's, it was very hard to know. And a lot of us in the press, as we came down from that second day argument, the, the way we talk to each other is, how hard are you going to write the lead? How predictive are you going to be? How much are you going to say that the mandate is in danger? 
And you, you calibrate that and you discuss it with your editors and then you add three sentences of caveats about, well, anything can happen once they start deliberating. <laughs> and, and the first thing is much more than in, the, in print, but in television, uh, you, you do have, and maybe it's a select audience, maybe it's only a million to three million on, on the best night watching the cable shows, but it gets picked up and it, the proliferation is extraordinary. Um, and yesterday there was a poll that 50% of, of Americans, so I never know what these polls really mean, you know, say that the decision that will, will be rendered will be political and will not be necessarily based on, on uh, the, the law. And, and so given, given the character of our, you know, sort of political talk show circuit, um, it, I think it behooves reporters <laughs> to be a little circumspect um, because I, I think the third branch, I think it is too important and it is a bit more intellectual and deserves more thought and not the sort of treatment that we give uh, the political horse race. But uh, just to play devil's advocate on that point, um, you know, when, when President Obama came out and made his statement, he was um, just trashed on Fox for what he said. Why should a Supreme Court justice who is, uh, let's face it, a political actor, mm -hmm. and, and as we heard in the previous panel, always has been, why should they get treated with kid gloves? Why, why not have a, an extremely robust uh, set of fisticuffs over uh, whether uh, Scalia is is brilliant or actually an overrated, uh, facile, um, <laughs> third-rate legal thinker. Well, you, I, think, uh, I think the terminology <laughs> that you, you just used is, is, is civil warfare as opposed to, you know, sort of, you know, Gingrich unilaterally hanging and disbanding the mm. Ninth Circuit or, you know, some of the commentary that we hear. Right. I don't have any problem with, with legitimate... Um, so Gingrich has criticism. set up the, 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 the G Gingrich is the limiting principle. <laughs> we don't want to we don't want to get to that point. Well, but well, something short of that, you're far, saying far beyond Gingrich. That yeah. was that was mild for some of those in that camp. But yeah, I think it's absolutely. I mean, I I want to know more about Thomas and and the money and I mean, where are reporters on these stories? Where are reporters on you know how much how much buddy buddying with the Federalist Society do you do before somebody says? Wait a minute. Um, so I don't see enough of that, but there's a way to do it um, where, where you're making a point and not destroy, trying I mean, to destroy the Arguably, there used to be more of this. If you look at the reporting that was done on you know, Abe Fortas when he was sure. on the bench, uh, so there was less reporting at the time of confirmation, and confirmation hearings were more non-events. But there was a lot more digging, maybe because people weren't tweeting, so they had time for digging, you know, about the outside activities of people on on the court. I didn't mean that as I mean there's so many. In our, uh, that was a its own facile comment because reporting generally is better now than it was in the Roosevelt era in terms of the education and diligence and expertise of reporters. So I'm I'm just curious that there's. You, you get the sense, and maybe this is a comment on journalism in general, that, you know, liberals will attack Thomas, conservatives will, you know, make uh, um, their comments about the liberal court. Um, but you feel like there's a little bit less um, penetrating reporting, I'm not talking about the people who are covering the court on a daily basis. I'm talking about investigative reporters. You just don't get the sense, and maybe I'm missing it, that assignment editors are sending very many reporters out there to dig around in the past of these justices. I mean, I, I think you have to keep that in perspective. First of all, one thing that's significantly different about the reporting of, or investigative reporting about the court now from Abe Fortas is that you don't have the director of the FBI hand delivering the information to the media to try to bring about the undoing of a justice. Um, I could right. do some digging if I had that start yeah, too. Just give me the point. file and you know, let that's me go. That's a good point. Um, yeah. You know, the Los Angeles Times spent a huge amount of time and effort on the the Scalia the duck hunting. Uh, 
mean, they did about five or six stories and what kind of plane and who paid for the trip and how long the trip was and and all that. And, it, you know, it sort of didn't go anywhere. I mean, not for want of trying. I think they dug about as hard as anybody could could do um, under the circumstances and didn't get much payoff Is, is it, it possible the justices are cleaner now because they haven't been in politics and they, they've come up, you know, they've been on uh, in lower courts where they also had to, uh, you know, keep their skirts clean uh, in order to get confirmed? I, I think that's not only, you know, I think it's very, very likely. I think you can have a lot of complaints about this court, depending on your politics, but that it's corrupt, yeah. that, that really, that, that seems far afield to me. And I think you mix apples and oranges when you, when you raise, quite rightly, the, the heat that the president took for making a statement, the, the, the initial statement, that really was factually questionable about whether striking it down would be unprecedented, given that the law had been passed by a large majority. You know, th those are factual points that were, were properly examined. And I hope, and you, I leave it to you to decide, but I hope when justices make factual assertions like that, that are open to question, they get the same kind of examination. It's a little harder to know how to do that when you're talking about an oral argument, because a lot of people really heard the court for the first time, and the first time recently with the same day audio, and we're probably surprised at how loose and conversational uh, these uh, the, the arguments are. But but those are questions, right? So it's hard. It's a little hard to know how how to fact check a question because it, it's a different kind of enterprise. Do you think cameras should be in uh, the Supreme Court? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. There's no principal Everybody reason agree? to keep to, to not allow citizens to see their government at work. And, you know, it's so fascinating. In the, in the couple of moments we've, we've had the audio tapes, these compelling moments, citizens listen. They care. They want to participate. And fighting, you know, this for years and then living through it for years, you know, the, the, the little hole in the wall somewhere doesn't, doesn't affect the proceeding. But who was it? Was it Breyer or who was it that said, I, si you know, that I simply don't want people knowing who I am walking down the street. Well, that's the best argument. But, but he made that argument before YouTube and before yeah, John yes. Stewart. These guys, guys want no part of it. Yeah. Not going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my wife works for the Colbert Report, and she managed to get um, Justice Stevens to go on Which Colbert. So <laughs> some of them actually like, like it. Uh, there was a, just a, 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 a little anecdote um, before we resume. Uh, the first question that he was asked by Stephen Colbert uh, was, well, he said, uh, welcome, Justice Stevens. It's a pleasure to have a sitting member of the Supreme Court on my program. And Justice Stevens said, well, actually, Stephen, I'm a retired member. And at that moment, Colbert looked around to his producer and said, Jimmy, I thought you said we were going to have a real one who was still on the bench. What are there, 10 or 12 of them? Couldn't you get one who was on the court? Um, uh, so let's, let's try to do a little bit of uh, contextual thinking given the earlier panel. Um, when, you, when you read the Simon book and listen to the earlier panel, what struck you as the biggest changes in covering the court and in the court's profile uh, over the last 75 years? What's changed the most? What has surprisingly not changed much at all? Well, I'll jump in as a consumer of that coverage um, uh, right, of the court and, and, in the and, and a chronicler, a chronicler of it, right. uh, reading a lot of uh, of Adam's predecessors at the New York Times and and other uh, newspapers at the time, and the coverage was really, as as John said, remarkable in that era, and um, the the degree of literacy. Um, uh, about the issues in question, either the policy issues about the New Deal or the constitutional questions that they raised, I, I think uh, in any historical context is really uh, remarkable um, and was something that I could really go to the bank with as a historical writer. Um, uh, I, I think one of the... I sorry, just want to cut you off on that. So the literacy was high. You had people talking about, you know, uh, opinions in a more sophisticated way, but... The reporting, 
the quality of the reporting and the reliability of the reporting, do you think that was higher also? I, I wouldn't say that it was higher. I think that's a very, I, I think you all, it's very hard to make a broad brush judgment like that because I, I think you look at the, the New York Times coverage of, of the court and, and the White House to a lesser degree in that period. And as I said, you can really go to the bank with this stuff. It's, it's really, um, when you check that against everything we have learned subsequently, it, it checks out. Um, not in every instance, but I think the, the hit rate is quite high. Um, when you're talking about the, the Chicago Daily Tribune, um, which was a strongly ideological paper, as many of them were in that time, um, there's much less attachment to fact. Um, and I would often read something that if I could take the Tribune's word for it, would be a remarkable thing for me to put in my book, but I, I could not find any verification anywhere for what it is that they that this reporter claimed to have witnessed. And so, I, I think that uh, you had, as as I think many people know, you had a highly um, self consciously partisan press in that period. And so, the Times was, as I think it it remains, something of an anomaly. And uh, I, I I think it, it's therefore difficult to to make even though I've just trafficked in a few, it's difficult to make too many generalizations. Well, so maybe we're going back to that era, that we had a period in the post-war period where there were a lot of great newspapers that were essentially mimicking the New York Times. Television, the evening news broadcast, mimicked the New York Times, took their cues from the New York Times and the Washington Post. And maybe now we're moving back into a partisan press era like we had in the early part of the 20th century and the 19th century and what they've had in Europe all this time. Um, and so what are the implications of that for the, for the court? Well, as long, as long as the court you know, continues to be the rather an independent, not in, not in opinions, but independent from uh, the rest of the government in the fashion that it is, I, I don't think it has an effect. But, but we've done this. I mean, I think when, when you describe this, I think about, um, you know, 1798 to 1801 is, you know, so where I go back, you, you know, yeah, You've got this in your book. Why, why don't you? Partisanship. Well, if anybody uh, yeah. hasn't read American Aurora, one of the best books I've ever read, and it is uh, just an amazing look at sort of that decade, um, and the author plays plays a narrator to the a line or two here and there, but it's basically editorials, letters, uh, communications between the leading politicians of that time so that you are getting the words, the emotion, the meat, uh, almost completely unfiltered and just one of the most extraordinary things. But you talk about partisanship. I mean, my Lord, we look like, um, you know, complete amateurs compared to what was going on back then. And there was some, I, I was reading Jim's book, which is a treat. You know, I thought it would be kind of a chore to get ready for this panel. <laughs> Jeff has written such a good book. Noah Feldman look, wrote a good book about the same period. It's a, it's a treat from start to finish. And one thing it reminded me, or perhaps told me the first, for the first time, because I never really read the old coverage, was just how good some of the writing was. Here's what the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette wrote about the black nomination. Hugo Lafayette Black, Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court, is a member of the hooded brotherhood that for 10 long blood-drenched years ruled the Southland with lash and noose and torch, the invisible empire knights of the Ku Klux Klan. He holds his membership in the masked and oath-bound legion as he holds his high office in the nation's supreme tribunal for life. Now that's writing, if you write that, yeah. you know, you can go. You can go <laughs> Um, now, I, I, um, the, the in-house legend about the Times goes contrary to Jeff's point, but as I said, I didn't read the old stuff. We're told that Supreme Court coverage really began when Justice Frankfurter called the Washington Bureau Chief, Scotty Reston, and said the coverage is horrible, you've got to get somebody serious. We just hired Anthony Lewis, we sent him to Harvard for a year of training. He comes back, starts what I think of as the modern tradition of New York Times reporting then followed with great distinction by Linda Greenhouse and then diminished by me. But, <laughs> uh, but, but maybe they were good back in the day. Uh, can I, uh, there's one parallel which is not exactly on point to talking about health care and some of the things we've been discussing, but it's striking to me because I think it's one of the biggest challenges about covering the court today 
And from what we know anecdotally, it was one of the biggest challenges about covering the court back then. And that is writing about procedural decisions that have enormous impact, but that are not apparently obvious at the time. There's the famous story about Stone calling Arthur Crock and telling him that they missed the Erie decision a week after the decision. And then Crock the next day wrote a column describing the Erie decision and how it was going to transform federal jurisdiction. And I think um, the, the hardest thing for reporters to do today still is report on those kinds of decisions. I mean, all the law students in the room have now studied Twombly and Iqbal in civil procedure. Um, go back and look at the coverage of Twombly and Iqbal the day that the cases were decided, and you would have no sense of the importance of them. That's not a criticism of the reporters, because I think it's very difficult to perceive the importance of that. Adam, to his credit, uh, uh, right after Iqbal, uh, a few weeks later, did a great story talking about how it was radicalizing procedure uh, in the courts. But the parallel that just was striking to me between the cover the failure to cover Erie and some the sometime failure to pick up on the significance of those kinds of decisions today, I think, is, is interesting. I, I, you're completely right about that. I, I missed Iqbal because it looked like a terrorism case. It looked like a really sexy case about, uh, you know, what, what kind of uh, pleading you had to, uh, to put in to sustain a claim against John Ashcroft for mis mistreating people in, in immigration detention in New York City. So everything about the case suggests it's a really cool terrorism case. But Steve is quite right, and, and he's – you know, it, it took me a couple of weeks to come around to this, that really what it is is a civil procedure case that completely revises pleading rules. Uh, how much time do you have, given all the other things you have to do, and I guess this would mostly be for, for Adam and Steve, uh, to read the briefs um, and, you know, be up to speed the way a lawyer would if they were having to file a motion or something like that, and how much of it is, is on the fly and you're just sitting in the press room cranking on deadline to get something presentable to get into the paper. The court doesn't work that hard. So, um, you know, they hear maybe 80 cases a year. And that means by the time the decision comes down, the reporter ought to be in very good shape to write. You should by then surely have read the main briefs and the SG briefs and a smattering of amicus briefs. You will have gone to the argument. You'll probably write a cert grant story. You'll write an argument story. You may write a, a setup story of some kind. So by the time on that morning in June when the decision lands, uh, if, if you have even a human amount of time to skim the decision, you should be able to crank out something. So you've made good. your decision on whether to cover a case at, uh, roughly at the time of oral argument. You know whether there's going to be significant or not. Because all cases are significant. They wouldn't be at the court if they weren't. So oh, I think yeah, that's not yeah. true at all. <laughs> Given that this is the court of uh, circuit splits, that's not true at all. So these diversity claims, are most of them are sort of boring what, cases? What, what you have a lot of is... Uh, a statute that affects five people, but two circuit courts have managed to interpret a word in there differently. And the court will now clear that up. So there's some significant number of cases that truly are. Can you tell that the justices are bored by that? And how does that reflect itself? Uh, I think two things. I think they actually enjoy some of the wordplay and statutory interpretation because they're all amateur grammarians. And the stakes are so low so they can have a little more fun with it. Uh, and also I hear uh, they're much less locked into their position. So it's a big constitutional case. They show up at conference, they know how they're going to vote. But they will say that if it's, if it's a case where the stakes are low, you can really have a more authentic discussion. You're more likely to be persuaded because you don't really care a, what the outcome is. A lot is. of people were surprised that they were going to take an initial vote, I guess, already by now. Like, it, it, why is their process not such that after they've heard the oral arguments, they go to conference and have some open-ended discussions among themselves about what they've heard and read. Why, why are they deciding so soon after oral arguments? I mean, it, the, their long-standing tradition is in part because they themselves have prepared for the arguments so much. They've read all the briefs. They've discussed it with their clerks that they go to oral argument pretty much with their minds made up. Oral argument is more an, an opportunity to, to disprove something that you, that you believed going in than it is to 
to really be persuaded. Most of them say that maybe their mind changes once a term, maybe. Um, so by the time the <coughs> argument is over, they pretty much all know what they're going to do, and they're, they're ready to go to conference. So in that there sense, that much more Don do. really not doing too well is not very consequential. That's right. That's right. Uh, the argument is also an occasion for them. It's the first time they've talked. And even though it looked in form, it's Q&A to the lawyer. In fact, it's what John Roberts, who used to argue before the court, it's a kind of, the, the advocate is a basketball backboard who tries to get in the game, but basically the justices are communicating with each other. And of course, these are very technical issues, so they're hard to sort of hash out in, you know, around the table through oral argument. It's much more likely if someone's going to be persuaded to change their mind, it will be in the drafting process when you actually see how the words look on paper. Although back to the earlier discussion, I think, and I, I don't know whether you agree, that um, Alito probably doesn't believe there is a limiting principle to the extent that Verrilli had succinctly given him one and it was a good one, it might have made a difference or it might have had an impact. Okay, let's um, open this up. We've got two mics uh, and uh, now's your chance to have at, have at us. Yes. Oops, we've got two coming. I, I was pointing to the far back you're first from the far back, and then. Uh... So I'm curious, uh, Supreme Court reporters, if, if you, uh, I don't know if you'd be willing to say, but given the preparatory work that you do, you ever kind of draft a few paragraphs anyway before, before the decision comes down? Not, not necessarily predicting how it's going to come out, but at least laying out the, uh, the case? Why, why does that seem like such a. Of course. That's, 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 that, that, first of all, it's none of the business of the matter, all the stuff that you know, is the facts of the thing. You want to do, right? And I, you know, I will tell you frankly that when Citizens United came down on a day quite rare, you usually don't know what case is coming down on what day, but for various reasons, you knew Citizens United was coming down. I pre wrote the article start to finish. I had a pretty good idea what was going to happen. I turned out to be exactly right. And at 10.02, I pushed the button, and I thought I looked pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> I used to do it for a different reason. When I covered the court for the Wall Street Journal, I also had to feed the Dow Jones Newswire. And that meant instantly. So I had two versions written for everything <laughs> and just had to pick one and push then. <laughs> so uh, this is I, – I have a question about a – an odd potential result. Could, could this be a case like the child online obscenity case or whatever, indecency case where there's a majority that's, or a concurring majority that says, here's how Congress can do it differently, that comes out against the uh, law, maybe includes Breyer, Roberts, et cetera, but says more like how to fix it, that this is a crummy law, maybe Obama, the administration doesn't like it, et cetera, but you come out with a forward-looking thing, which, uh, et cetera. So it's an odd question. I, I, it's not, I wouldn't say it's totally improbable, but I think the, the nature and tone of the argument about severability and the strong sentiment from many justices that if the mandate is struck down, it's not our place to figure out what to do. We ought to leave it up to Congress to figure out what to do would make me think that's not very likely. But let's talk about severability for just a second. Um, what do people think about on that issue, whether, whether it's if they do strike it down, it's more likely to have the whole thing struck down or whether they'll just strike down the, the individual mandate? Just, I know it's guessing, guesswork, but. I, the odd thing from the argument, and again, the government even on this kind of had a bad day, the government has a compromise position that two closely linked provisions of the, um, of the law should fall along with the mandate, should the mandate fall. I think that seemed like the least likely outcome by the end of the argument, even though there's a lot of logic to it. These are the uh, provisions that require the insurance companies to take on uh, additional people at fixed prices without regard to um, pre-existing conditions. And if you don't have the additional people being forced into the marketplace, that makes it economically very hard for the insurance companies. So there's a real logic that only that part of the law should fall um, and the rest of it involving all kinds of stuff that has nothing to do with anything might be sustained. I sort of had the sense that that outcome is not likely. 
What's possible is the surgical strike, which really kicks it back to Congress, or taking out the whole law, in which case it'll be a long time before I think there's uh, legislative action on this front. Any other any other thoughts on that? Because this 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 is what they're probably talking about the the severability part of it. Um, any, anybody? Uh, Which I think is surprising because it's again a, a lot of your reflections um, earlier. Listening to that is is you go in with one mindset. And then the oral arguments, which we've just said, and usually are rather inconsequential um, because minds are pretty well made up, and yet what occurred during those arguments, we now, at least the mood is, uh, is dictating what we think will happen. And it was, the, it was based on the conversations and the oral arguments, which surprised both on the severability and the challenges uh, the commerce challenges to the notion of an individual mandate. But, but that's our perceptions that have been shaken, not necessarily the justices' perceptions. That's right, but it's interesting how there's been, and maybe it's just the, the herd mentality, but the, converse, the pre-conversation, the during-argument conversation, the post-conversation, all seem to be quite surprising, turning on uh, a lot of what happened in the courtroom. The other thing the justices will say, I'm sorry, Jim, is um, that they will sel seldom move on the outcome, but they'll often move on the rationale. You know, so if you can help them get from here to there, they, they know where they want to come out, but they need you know, the reasoning that will you know, look right on paper, pick up additional votes, and so on. I'm sorry. Yeah, Jim. John, uh, Adam and I have talked about this, the uh, uh, possible outcome. And uh, it seems that the, uh, the uh, pivotal justice is Kennedy. And if Kennedy votes to sustain the mandate, perhaps uh, the Chief Justice will go along. Uh, and I know Kennedy is, uh, changes his mind uh, and has uh, famously changed his mind several times. Uh, uh, we know this from, from notes, he, that he changed his, nine, uh, changed his mind on uh, the middle school prayer uh, decision. He changed his mind on the... Uh, Planned Parenthood v. Casey. I, that is after he voted in conference. And another uh, uh, case that I wrote about, uh, which was really an interpretation of the Civil Rights Act, uh, uh, 1866 uh, Civil Rights Act, he was originally uh, with the majority, uh, the Brennan majority. He was with the liberals, and he said that it really applied. And then Brennan kept writing draft after draft to try to get uh, uh, Kennedy to sign on, and ultimately he failed. And, and Kennedy changed his mind and wrote the decision for the conservatives on the court. So my question is from, I guess particularly from Adam, but Steve and others, uh, how uh, likely is it that Kennedy, who might go in with one position on the individual mandate, uh, might change his mind? Of, of course it's perfectly possible. But what we know is the questioning, and what we know is how he voted in Morrison and Lopez, which was to strike down two major federal statutes on Commerce Clause grounds. I think there's, you know, there's some significant evidence that uh, it wouldn't be very hard for him to put himself in a frame of mind to strike down the mandate. I mean, Especially since he's using this heavy burden language. I mean, is, is, uh, I don't, I'm not in this, uh, uh, this business, but isn't that... Uh, pretty important code when you say heavy burden? My, my presumption is actually different than I think what other people's is. I don't think Kennedy would vote to uphold the mandate as the lone fifth vote. I think it's more likely that Roberts would vote to uphold the mandate and Kennedy would join Roberts and make it six to three. And I guess we'll never know, right? We'll never know that. So I can't who be wrong. Who? I can only be wrong because they'll strike down the mandate. But. You don't think, well, won't we know from the clerks after a decent interval of time? Like a 20-year interval. Why, why do you think it will take so long for, nowadays everybody talks, so why wouldn't the clerks, the, when they become former clerks, be talking... Uh, you know, next year. The, the only thing the clerks have talked about is Bush versus Gore in the last 20 years, really, probably. Well, maybe Tubin has some stuff. Well, yeah, that's like, I we think don't know Tubin's where Tubin got, got it, it all, so he yeah. doesn't tell us. But uh, Anybody else have any thoughts on Kennedy? Uh, I'm just struck by the fact that for 30 years, 
Every time the subject of health care came up, there was only one important name, Kennedy. <laughs> now, <laughs> you know, we're, we're just back where we've always been. Um, so, uh, yes? To, uh, just to answer Monroe's question and tie into something that Adam said before I ask my question, which is going to be a view, Jim. Um, I think it's, it's, it's so ironic if people are hanging their hat on federalism as a means of defending individual liberty against this onus of the so-called individual mandate. Because Monroe, during the oral argument, a number of the so-called conservative justices uh, volunteered. Well, of course, any state, such as Massachusetts, could go ahead and pass this very same thing, and there would be absolutely no constitutional argument against it. Moreover, they also volunteered that we could have a completely nationalized health care system, the one that was considered too much of creeping socialism even for most of the Democrats, right? the single-payer option. So if people are deluding themselves that a victory for, quote, federalism would be a victory for individual liberty, I think that's, you know, that's again where there's a disconnect between the public and the politics and the, rhetoric, the technical rhetoric that's going on at the Supreme Court. I actually debated Randy Barnett the day of that, that he was featured in the New York Times. And um, his argument and that of many others is, well, yeah, the form of liberty that you have is you can move to a state, you can move out of Massachusetts. Or, and, and I just don't think that, that that lines up with most people's sense of, of real freedom. Um, the question that I had was I wanted to take advantage of um, Jim's own experience and ask you, Jim, from what you've heard on this panel and what you observe as a consumer of legal journalism, having been on the other side, uh, how, has, how has legal journalism changed since you were doing it yourself? Thank you for asking that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, uh, I think uh, as has been discussed on the panel, I think the New York Times is has always set the uh, the standard from Tony Lewis, certainly uh, through Linda Greenhouse, and I also believe Adam Liptak as, as well. Um, when I was uh, covering uh, the court, uh, I wasn't covering from Washington, but I was doing some stories mainly from New York, and I did some profiles and some decisions. I think we could, uh, I almost count the legal journalists on one hand. There were, I mean, we went to, uh, I remember we went to the, when uh, Warren Berger had just uh, uh, been appointed Chief Justice, we went to the ABA uh, uh, meeting. It was in Dallas, actually. And uh, I think there were five of us. Uh, you know, there's the New York Times, the Washington Post, one of the wire services, uh, Newsweek, and Time, I think. I, I mean, there might have been a, a sixth person. So I think the the number of people covering the court now is certainly, uh, and the education of those uh, uh, covering is, is, is certainly uh, expanded. Um, I, I, uh, so I, I think overall it's, it's been pretty good, I, uh, quite good. Uh, one of the things that's a, a problem, I want to get to uh, one thing that Steve uh, mentioned, and that is that nobody talks anymore. <laughs> Which, which is a real problem for journalists uh, if, if nobody talks. And I mean, you know, when I was doing my book and, and Jeff doing his book, and uh, you know, people talked. And Steve, certainly with the, with with Brennan, that uh, first of all there was a paper trail, which was wonderful. I mean, Stone was talking to Frankfurter all the time, and and uh, Frankfurter was talking to the president, and and it went on and on. And and you don't have much of that anymore. Frankfurter talked to everybody, he wrote everything down. Right. Uh, and you don't have the justices exchanging those kinds of memos. We don't, at least we're not aware of them. And I'm, I worry for the future, for those writing the, the future histories, how much they're going to be able to come up with, uh, uh, which we were fortunate to uh, in, a, in, a, in an earlier uh, period. This is a terrible, terrible problem. I mean, you know from all the, the wealth of material you had and with Frankfurter and Brandeis, uh, you know, and, and when I was working on my FDR book, it was, there was just a feast of letters and 
other things you could draw on. And now, I mean, imagine even if people somehow preserve their emails, nobody puts anything interesting in emails, and it's really going to be a problem. You know, I, I'll just speak um, from the perspective of working for a period of time, as John mentioned, in the White House, the Clinton White House, which got a little attention from the special prosecutor from time to time. And uh, this had an effect, as you might expect, on the kind of correspondence that you would have internally. I, when I first got there at the beginning of 1998, I got my job offer the day the Lewinsky scandal broke. So you can question my uh, career judgment. Um, uh, I, I had lunch in the mess in the, those first couple of weeks with a senior advisor to President Clinton and uh, Robert Dalek, who you all know, a great historian and first-rate biographer of Lyndon Johnson and John Kennedy. And, and Bob was making the plea to me, in front of this advisor, to write everything down, to keep a diary, um, and to this senior advisor, who was certainly more important than me and closer to the president. And this advisor said, look, Bob, here's what I do every day. See this little card? And he pulled it out of his pocket. He said, this is my schedule. I write it down in the morning, and I shred it on my way out the door. I do not write another word all day. Because anything that you write immediately was discoverable in any one of these investigations that were being run uh, by um, you know Dan Burton's uh, subcommittee, and when we would click, and this is certainly still true, uh, whether the technology has evolved, you would write an email and you would click send, and as it was being sent, you would see appearing in the CC uh, uh, column uh, records management and then off it went. So you always knew that it was being copied to records management and stored somewhere so that when uh, a call came in through the counsel's office for every email you ever wrote mentioning Bob Barr, those emails were going in. And so uh, I, I think in every branch of government, it's not just the, the, the general decline in literacy in an age of cell phones and email, which is a big part of the problem, but when anybody in Washington writes anything down of interest, it's an accident. And so I, I think it will be very difficult for the flow of information that we get and the leaks and so forth, it's going to be very difficult to write the kind of book that John wrote about about FDR or, or the books, Jim, that you've written that I, that I have written. Uh, it's, it's going to be impossible. Nobody sits down and writes these memos anymore. It's a dangerous thing to do. It's a dumb thing to do. There's a great example of this in connection with the health care case. You recall that Elena Kagan was Solicitor General um, as, as the law was enacted. And soon there were challenges, and soon the idea was, uh, was uh, cooked up that they should have a big meeting <coughs> to decide how to handle these legal challenges. And uh, uh, Kagan's uh, deputy, Neil Katyal, writes her an email that says, uh, having the first big kickoff meeting to defend the ACA tomorrow, I really think you should attend. And the response from Kagan was, what's your phone number? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it all, it really, the, the pivotal moment was at the very beginning of the Clinton administration when there was a Treasury mm -hmm. aide named Josh Steiner, who is now uh, – a big investment banker in New York, and he kept a diary. And the prosecutors made his life miserable for having kept that diary. Um, and so I'm not sure anybody keeps a diary anymore. But it's I also, tragic. I assume Supreme Court justices and their clerks are certainly not saving their emails, um, and, and they're not legally required to because they're not covered by anything like the presidential paper statutes. Uh, and even if they do save them, you know, Justice Souter closed his papers for 50 years. So um, by the time they're open to anybody, there won't be anybody that cares about them. Um, <laughs> yeah, he who forgets history doomed to repeat it. Well, we're not even going to record history, so we can just stay on the <laughs> Yeah, Which is why, I mean, just a, a self-interested plea, uh, you know, I'm working on a, another Obama book now and trying to interview people and, you know, a month or two after things happen when their memories are still fresh. But if you have friends and colleagues who are engaged in things that you might believe are his, of historic interest, encourage them to, you know, record their memories or talk to a journalist they trust or a friend that they trust because by the time they try to remember it, 
10 years later, and they're doing these oral histories like they have at Columbia, which are wonderful, but the stories by that time you know, have hair growing on them and are not as accurate. Well, what's uh, the concept of primary sources anymore? If, if you basically have eliminated so only an ultimate conclusion um, is, is your place to try and work back and understand, then what we've lost is immeasurable. You can really see uh, the consequences when you read this fantastic book by Stacy Schiff on Cleopatra. She has no documents. There are no records of people who had any firsthand connection with her or any documents from Alexandria, uh, just you know, one or two coins. So everything is based on what people in later years either made up or heard seventh hand. And so it's extremely difficult to get to any real picture of who she was. Um, that's a very cheery note on which to, I guess, end. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to thank everybody for coming, and I want to thank Jim Simon for this.